Thank you, Kent, and good evening, all. Good afternoon, I guess I should say. Um, lovely day for a concert. I was thinking a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago even, uh, maybe some of you would be hesitant to come out in the snow that we had, but you can't complain about today, considering we're three days before spring, when everything's overnight will change to flowers blooming and grass growing. Yeah, right. <clears throat> Antonio Vivaldi was a Venetian composer, educator, and priest. Uh, although he composed a considerable body of chamber music, church music, and opera, he's best known for his over 200 concertos, works for solo instrument, or sometimes solo instruments, and orchestra. Um, most were written for a group of orphaned girls. They must have been very good players. Some of them are challenging pieces. He was assigned to, as a priest, in Venice, um, Usually a concerto is for, as I say, solo instrument, but in this case, the one we're playing today is officially called a concerto grosso. Uh, written about 1725, the means is a group grosso, a group of soloists. Each of the section players, each of the section leaders, I should say, in the orchestra, has a brief solo, primarily in the second movement, the slow movement of this little concerto. Uh, the title, Alla Rustica, may have been uh, attached to reflect the use of the Lydian scale for my theory students, uh, we would just call it not quite major um, in the third movement, the third and last movement. The scale pattern uh, was common in Italian folk music of that day and time. Um, although t today, Vivaldi is a mainstay composer, certainly of the era, the Baroque era, uh, shortly after his death, he was basically forgotten. He was uh, resuscitated, as you were, by people in the mid 20th century, but everybody in the late 18th century, who was a musician, studied him, including our composer at the end of the first half, Johann Sebastian Bach, who transcribed some of Vivaldi's uh, works for the organ. Um, so let's see what Bach learned from Vivaldi in Concerto alla Rustica.
You still have about 199 Vivaldi concertos to catch up with if you're uh, of the mood to do so. Our next work is by a somewhat obscure composer. He's actually known for a lot of oboe concertos, and no one seems to know why. But Tommaso Albinoni, like Vivaldi, was a Venetian, uh, a composer of the late 17th and turn of the 18th century, best known in his own day for operas. Uh, however, at the end of the Second World War, especially in Dresden, uh, many of them were destroyed, and they had not been published, so there were no copies to be had. So when we think of Tommaso Albinoni today, we think of his instrumental music, which somehow was published. Uh, there's a lot of musicological discussion, controversy, if you will, about the celebrated adagio in G minor that we're about to play. It was said to have been um, uh, pieced together from little fragments, a violin part and some part of the harpsichord or continuo part uh, in the mid-20th century, 1950s, by a guy named Remo Galaziono. Um, and depending on how you find this authentic um, or just the invention of Galaziono, uh, we may be more correct attributing this work to the, the latter mid-20th century scholar um, who may or not uh, imbued the piece with a lot of his own ideas, um, but that's the nature of the beast. And it's one of those pieces that uh, I think, concentrate now, you'll go out of the um, concert hall today with this tune in your head and you'll go two or three days from now, where did I hear that? It's one of those pieces that sort of stick with you. Very slow-tempoed, lovely adagio by Tommaso Albinoni.
Now, isn't that a lovely piece? So lovely that all the players are getting up to leave. They're, they're crying. Maybe not. We reposition ourselves in our palace setting here, as Baroque music would have often been, especially for the next piece. This is uh, the man, Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, he composed six Brandenburg concertos uh, in a happy period in his life when he was working for a prince in a small town called Kirten, in Germany, of course. Uh, and they employ different instruments in each of the six concertos. They were commissioned by one of your friends, Prince Christian Ludwig, uh, Margrave of Brandenburg, hence the term Brandenburg Concertos, somewhere between 1717 and 1723. Um, as I say, each of them requires different instrumentation. This one is all strings. Um, with the exception of concerto number one, which is larger and more robust, I guess you would say, you can make use of a very small orchestra for this piece. The prince, apparently, due to lack of funds or cheapness, had only six full-time musicians in his employ, so he had to augment for this third concerto with some more players because it's four groups of three violins, three violas, and three cellos, plus double bass, so 10 players plus the harpsichord, the continual. Um, there's an improvised cadenza as the second movement. He left us only two chords in the second movement, which is a little brief, even for a slow movement. So the first movement is rather vigorous. It's all based on a single theme, which you'll hear over and over again, passed around the, the players. And the last movement is like a dance. There's a dance of that time called a jig, G-I-G-U-E, and it has that kind of dancey rhythm in triple time. Um, so here we go, Brandenburg Concerto number three.
Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Here's a thing you wouldn't have, want to write on a check every time you wrote a check. Heinrich Ignaz Franz von Bieber. He was an Austrian, some say Czech, violinist and composer. Uh, he was renowned in his own lifetime for his extraordinary virtuosity on the violin, composer, including several innovations that uh, had been not dreamt up at that point. Violinists will understand this. He played in the sixth and seventh position, which basically means way up the fingerboard. Uh, he played many harmonics, two strings at once, and even uh, is famous for what is called scordatura, which is the retuning of several, or if not all, of the strings to allow harmon uh, harmonies to be played that wouldn't be uh, available with the usual tuning of the violin. Um, to knowledgeable critics, he must have been, or was thought to have been, the best violinist of the 17th century. He um, must have come in contact somewhere with some trumpet players. He worked for a number of years in Salzburg, which is the birthplace of Mozart, but of course not at the same time. Several of his works feature the trumpet, including one that we are not going to play this evening, for eight trumpets and timpani, for which you should be grateful. This afternoon we'll confine ourselves to a single trumpet, heard in combination with a somewhat unusual orchestration, violin, two viola parts, cello bass, and harpsichord. Please welcome Christopher Napier with the orchestra in this rarely heard work by H.I.F. Bibber.
Alessandro Scarlatti was one of um, the most prolific composers of his day. He is renowned for his operas, which were about 115 in number, and, e and over 600 cantatas, mostly based on secular themes. In southern I Italy, he was responsible for establishing a vibrant new style known as the Neapolitan School, Neapolitan meaning from the city of Naples, as an opera composer. He worked extensively in Sweden, which seems a little unusual for a Sicilian-born composer, but he got around, apparently. He's widely admired and respected in his own lifetime, even by another really fine composer of Baroque opera, George Frederick Handel, who we will hear next. In Rome, uh, he was the chapel master of a very famous church called Santa Maria Maggiore, and it was there that he probably wrote this next motet, uh, which is called O Magna Mysterium, which is not too far from English, O Great Mystery. The Latin text deals with the birth of Christ. Please join me in welcoming the Macomb Chamber Choir and its director, Todd Moses. Thank <laughs> you. 
lovely work by Scarlatti. We're going to conclude with the work of Handel this afternoon. Um, thank you for being with us and hoping to see you back here on Friday the 20th of April for the final concert of the season called Just for a Laugh. We will need a laugh considering the weather we've had this winter. So come back on Friday the 20th and join us again. Um, at that concert, you hear the music of Leonard Bernstein, Mozart, Jacques Ibert, and Paul Duca. Uh, you will recognize The Sorcerer's Apprentice, Duca's most famous composition from its inclusion in the Disney Fantasia, undoubtedly Duca's most familiar, most popular work, maybe for that reason. Um, to say that the finale of this afternoon's program is grand is a bit of an understatement. Handel wrote coronation anthems, and this particular one, Zadok the Priest, is one of four that he wrote for the coronation of George II, King of England, in 1727, written uh, by the German-born but newly naturalized Georg Friedrich Handel, who now becomes George Frederick Handel, probably became that long before he was naturalized. Uh, brief text is drawn from the book of Kings in the Bible. I guess it's always a, a good thing to try to connect biblical figures of great importance like King Solomon with contemporary monarchs like George II, giving them credibility with their people. Uh, Zadok was so impressive, the, the music and the text, I guess, that it immediately became popular in George's time, both George's, George II and George Frederick Handel, that it has continued to be performed every time there's a monarch crowned at Westminster Abbey ever since, including Elizabeth II in, I guess that was 1953. So uh, keep track of this, and you'll hear it again, I'm sure, not too far down the road if you follow coronations. The coronation anthem number one, Zadok the Priest. <laughs> 